joining us for another Mission Essential Conversation. We're excited to bring you IO, The War of Influence, with Colonel Andrew Zackerel, interviewed by Major General Clay Hutmacher. In this new age of information warfare, the art of influence, psychological operations, psyops, or information operations, MISO, our adversaries like Russia and China will always be working against US interests. Even if there isn't active combat, we recognize that our adversaries never rest in peace and stability. The Russians use gray zone strategies, China's three warfares approach. These and other state actors will always compete against our interests in lieu of major combat. Uh, today, we'll look back at, history, at a history of information operations, what it is, how it's evolved through the war in Afghanistan and the role in its current global landscape. The integration of cultural understanding and human expertise is our focus at Mission Essential. IO is a key component of global security today. And the type of diversity of threats demand ongoing vigilance and understanding. And as always, for context, I like to throw in that Mission Essential is the largest provider of language services to DOD. We've completed over 100,000 missions with 20,000 linguists in 83 countries. And specific to SOCOM, we have currently over 400 personnel in theater. Our services there include language and cultural and intelligence analysis. We hope this conversation will continue to inform and inspire you. With that, I'm privileged, as I've been many times recently, thank you, uh, to uh, introduce Major General Clay Hotmucker, who was a career United States Army officer and retired in 2018. He served 40 years in uniform with an extensive special operations aviation background, serving at all levels within the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment and as the commanding general of the U.S. Army Special Operations Aviation Command. Today, Major General Hotmucker serves as the president and CEO of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, which empowers families of fallen, wounded, fallen and wounded Special Operations Forces. Major General Hotmucker, I'll turn it over to you to introduce Andrew and continue with the interview. The con is yours. Thanks, Brian. I, I appreciate the, uh, the kind words in the intro. Um, before I, I dive into introducing Andy, who I consider the finest information officer, PSYOPs officer I've ever encountered in my 40 years of military experience, you know, I, I want to just take a second to uh, discuss briefly how my feeling on and understanding of information operations matured when I came in to be the J3. So I was, you know, as, as you stated, I was a career Army aviator, special ops aviator, and more specifically, I was an attack helicopter pilot. And so um, I, you know, kinetic operations were job security for me. That's what I did my whole career. But I quickly came to realize when I got down to US SOCOM that the future wasn't, I mean, kinetic operations will still be a component, but the future was really information information operations uh, were where we really needed to develop a capability to stay relevant and to, uh, and to defend our nation effectively in the future. So, you know, having come to that realization, a key person that was responsible for that maturing of my thought process there was Andy Zackerel. Again, um, the best information science officer I have Encountered, and I have encountered more than a few of my tour. He has a unique blend in his 28 years of military experience. He has a unique blend of operational and combat experience, staff experience, and academic uh, credentials that really put him in this position in this, uh, where he's on a, on a, in a different plane than, than the majority of his peers. Andy has led operational uh, and combat missions as the commander in Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He also led information operations in New Orleans following the Katrina uh, hurricane that rolled through there many years ago. So vast experience operationally. On the staff side, uh, Army Central Command, U.S. Army Special Operations Command, ISAF in Afghanistan, and the special op rolling and ending is uh, last tour here in the Special Operations Command in the J-39. Who, and he was the lead on the Joint Meso Web Ops Center, uh, we refer to now as Jim Wick. Uh, he led that, and I hand-selected him to lead that based on his, his skill and competence, and which I believe will be a game changer for us in the years to come, uh, both for SOCOM and the nation. 
academically, he got his uh, Bachelor of Arts degree from Oklahoma, his Master's of Science in Information Operations from the Naval Postgraduate School. He was also an International Security Studies Fellow at Tufts University. And if that's not enough, when he retired as a colonel, he's going to law school. Uh, and he uh, graduate uh, in May of 2022. So in, in summary, he reminds me of me, he's just a lot smarter. So uh, with that, Andy, welcome. Uh, really glad to have you here. When, when we were talking about an expert on information operations, there was only one name that I was even considering and, and you were it. And I, you know, I, I don't generally like to uh, compliment people too, too much publicly, but you've certainly earned it. And, uh, and I'm in every word I said. So welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm humbled by, all, by the introduction. My gosh. <laughs> well, okay. Well, don't let it go to your head. If you need to, you can talk to your wife afterwards and let her bring it, keep it real for you. She, she's very good at that. I can't yeah, yeah, as you. is mine. As is mine. <laughs> uh, okay. Before we jump into this, uh, um, into the meat of this discussion on information operations, I.O. or information operation is a term that gets tossed around a lot and I suspect uh, defined uh, inaccurately by some and, and you know, um, so from a from your perspective as a tactical practitioner of I.O. on many different levels, both obviously tactical staff, um, you know, what is I.O.? You know, define it for us. Okay, um, so to think about information operations, um, it's important to both realize what it is and what it is not. At its heart, it is the integrated application of informationally related capabilities. Um, by the way, that are IRCs. Um, an IRC is a term that's so broad you could drive a bus through it. Um, and we'll talk about that I think a little bit later on, but, but really IO is that is that effort to integrate those pieces together. Think of it as the informational equivalent of combined arms. Um, and you know, the, that is where you really um, focus on putting all of the capabilities together, whether it's attack aviation, maneuver forces, um, et cetera. That's the, the heart of information operations. What it's not, and this is a common, this is probably the single most common misuse of the term, is it's not any one of the particular uh, subspecialties are IRCs that are in there. And there are some fairly core informationally related capabilities. PSYOP is one that people mention, electronic warfare, um, cyber. Um, those are all unique specialties. And where you may be encountering, um, and the way that we tend to grow um, information operations officers, particularly the senior ones, um, they come out of one of those fields, but then develop their skill sets to, to learn how to integrate and fuse those capabilities together. So what IO really is, is that integrated application of informationally related capability to achieve the effect needed um, either in war or peacetime. Okay, well, thank, thanks for defining uh, that for me. And, um, and, you know, as I, when I stated in your bio, you've been working in IO and PSYOPs for last 20 years plus. Um, and the operating environment has certainly changed. I mean, just looking at my iPhone and looking at the apps on my really underscore that, right? And my kids, you know, I'll say, hey, I'm on Twitter. And they're like, oh, that's so yesterday, dad. We're on Instagram, Snapchat, and blah, 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 blah. And I, I mean, and I'm a, I'm a neophyte, right? You know, I think it's appropriate that I type on my phone with my thumbs. But, um, you know, talk about that, that change, because I mean, really the speed of information and all of those things from leaflet drops and today's gun, there's still, I think in some environments are probably some good applications uh, in that. But tell, you know, let's talk through the changes you've seen uh, in your last 20 years. Oh, absolutely. So beyond the, the general, you know, the, the appreciation for the relevance of information operations, really, I kind of lump into the three major shifts that occurred. And, and as you mentioned, so I got my master's degree in defense analysis information operations uh, in 1999 to 2000. Um, at that point in time, it was this interesting niche field that was kind of an interesting thing to study it while I was at NP or at Naval Postgraduate School. It was great. But, uh, you know, a lot of people at that point in time 
just you know and even for years afterwards when we'd arrive we'd start you know working with with the unit it wasn't uncommon to get the question well why does this even matter now i don't think i would ever get that question um, but the three major shifts you see is both the, the the explosion in the variety and complexity of capabilities that are at are that are uh, available to us uh, and to our adversaries um, the modern tools that are now being applied in traditional environments you know the um, you know, there's, there's a line from a Paul Simon song about uh, these are the days of miracles and wonders and lasers in the jungle. Well, the lasers are in the jungle. The cell phones are in the desert. Um, the, you know, there is everywhere in the world is now touched by modern technology. Um, but it's really interesting how it gets adopted in, in many places. And then the operational tempo um, in the informational environment, it's just so fast. The action, response, re, or, you know, um, counteraction, et cetera, is just phenomenally quick. And all of those things really drive what you have to look at when you are evaluating both what information, information capabilities you're going to apply, how you build them into your plan, but then also, um, you know, in, in, in the final days of my, of my time in uniform, as we were trying to build an organization that was going to be relevant, all of these things had to be forefront in our mind um, and really develop the capability. So we, you know, and I use the Jim Wick as an example oftentimes, but the, you know, as we were trying to explain to people, you know, this is why we need these capabilities in this arrangement, in this design, um, that was essential. All three of those really focused our minds on that. And uh, so, I mean, looking at the variety of tools, let's kind of walk through them if, you, if you'd like. Um, you, first of all, you have the undeniable um, growth of cyber as a medium. Uh, when in 1999, when I was you know playing with personal computers and things like that, people didn't think. I mean, a computer was how you got your work done. Um, it was how you built a spreadsheet if you were trying to you know manage finances or something like that. People didn't think of it as a predominant means or how they were going to communicate with other human beings. But it has really shifted to that, and that. Part of that was the extension and growth of social media. Um, if, if even in 2010, as we were starting to really look at this, if somebody had said, you're going to need a military capability that can interact and conduct influence via social media, or via social media people would have looked at, looked at us like we were crazy. Um, but really, it has grown into a major, I would say, dominant form of human communication and expression. Um, and so essential that we, we have a capability there. Um, additionally, um, informational mediums have become very complex. Um, and this is, uh, it, uh, you know, the movement away from just simple single channel, you're using broadcast, you're dropping leaflets, et cetera, into you have to be coming at them or you're coming at an audience with in multiple mediums and you have to be, and those mediums are, are complex and nuanced in how you access them and how you, uh, and or, how you combat them because sometimes in information operations that that integrated application is actually shutting off a particular uh, medium or information stream so that it doesn't conflict with how you, how you do that while you are dominating or really coming through strong on another medium so if you don't want an adversary's radio broadcasts to conflict with the message you're putting out on television is a very simple example then jam the radio broadcast but nowadays Jamming a radio broadcast is not as simple as it used to be. Just simply look at, I mean, how, how do you jam a, you know, a frequency hopping radio system that's going over multiple frequencies at once? Um, that's just a simple example of how complex they've become. Um, the next part is the extension of, of tools into traditional environments, places we wouldn't have thought of. Um, it's an interesting fact to realize that the second largest, I'm sorry, the, the largest single, um, market for secondhand cell phone handsets is uh, pretty much from uh, Afghanistan down through South Asia uh, into Bangladesh. Well, so this is an iPhone 11 uh, and it became outdated yes, or, or, or earlier this week when Apple announced the iPhone 12. So right now, a secondhand in the secondhand cell phone market, um, a, a, a young man, in Bangladesh can pick up an iPhone 7 uh, for a relatively inexpensive price. Um, and that gives him access to the world all the way up to 4G if, if his network is extending there. And 
if industry is absolutely extending those markets. But one of the things that really fascinated us as we looked at this was how societies, not our own, but other societies adopt those new technologies into their traditional communications means. And so a cultural understanding is necessary to take a look at that. Um, and this is gonna sound like a really bizarre example, but uh, we had a team, I had teams for several years operating in Indonesia. And uh, in Indonesia, they use, of all things, shadow puppetry to convey moral and object lessons. It's a traditional form of communication. But so what I had a team working there, a really good program on um, counterviolent extremism, where what they were doing though is they were using cell phone messaging to bring attention to and to bring audiences in to receive counterviolent extremism messaging through the traditional medium. So fusing together those two mediums, modern and traditional, in a real in a, in a nuanced way. And to be effective in this modern information environment, you've got to you've got to uh, take it that into account. How does how does the uh, how does the society that's receiving this technology that looks very familiar to you really actually apply it, which may not be familiar to you? Um, the other part is operational tempo. It's just unbelievably quick now. Um, it there's a twenty you know the twenty four hour news cycle is is a uh, is a constantly hungry beast that must be fed and it will pull information in. Um, and not only that, but everybody on the planet is a potential producer of informational content. Once again, the camera on the back of this phone um, allows people anywhere in the world to videotape, to create a message, to put that message out. And a failure to account for that can be catastrophic. Um, and the, this example, once again, uh, used numerous times to explain to people why we needed such a powerful capability within DOD at the Jimwick was, it's an, it's an example called the Red Wedding um, that they used. Uh, it was, there was a strike operation that occurred um, in Yemen. And uh, before the strike platform returned to base, our adversary had actually gotten, started sending out tweets that that strike had hit a wedding party. Um, that, that was picked up by Al Jazeera, which then promptly moved rapidly to other uh, media outlets. And before we know it, we had a full-blown 15-6 and a suspension of operations until that 15-6 was, um, was resolved. That, so that is a perfect example, both of the speed, because the White House picked it up, the it was a presidentially directed 15-6, um, but that speed happened so fast because there was no preparation. Nobody had ever thought, thought of that. And it also drove on the point that there you have an informational action that just created a, a, an absolute operational effect. You, they got a suspension of operations without ever firing a shot. They just fired some tweets at the right time. Um, and so you have to have a, a rapid, constantly prepared capability if you're going to be, if you're going to be a, a player in this environment, particularly at the strategic level. Um, and that's absolutely essential. But the other, you know, there's other two other things you need to keep in the back of your mind. Number one, um, you have to proactive planning is invaluable in this environment. Think ahead. What could go wrong? How do I how do I put myself in position not to be a victim of the environment, but rather to be to be the master of the environment? The second part is the time to coordinate with other entities that can provide capability, like our interagency partners or um, our international partners, is before, not after. But if, if something's going south, it's too late. You're, our, you're, ju you're just along for the ride at that point in time. And so getting that, you know, time, you know, that timely co coordination is absolutely essential. I, uh, you know, you brought back a lot of memories of my time in Iraq where we had the same situation. We roll off a target before we were back at the uh, forward support base and rearmed, refueled for the next thing there'd be these uh, on social media, would, the enemy would be way out in front of us. And I, I just remember there was a lot of frustration on the approvals that we had to modify. And everything you said, I mean, resonates with me. And, you know, and, and agility uh, is, is so critical in this environment. And, uh, and you certainly captured that well. Okay, I wanna to touch on, you know, you talked about information rate related capabilities, IRCs. Um, can you can you dive into that a little bit deeper and sort of and talk us through what what the different IRCs are? Sure. Um, so 
your IRCs, you, IRCs kind of fall into what I call three classes of them, but that is not doctrinal. And frankly, it's been a constantly shifting thing in all of the services doctrine and to a certain extent, the joint doctrine. Um, but really, so you've got your obvious ones. Psychological operations are otherwise known as MISO. Electronic warfare, cyber operations, military deception. All of these are core IRC, or IRCs. Then you've got the IRCs that are, are really kind of based on how they're used. Um, civil affairs operations oftentimes can be, have an informational related content or can be done for informational purposes or in concert with. Um, that Indonesian puppet show that I, that I mentioned before um, is, is a great example where you bring in some CMO activities as well to really make that a, the most effective and com compelling act or operation pos or that you can possibly do. Combat camera for documentation, public affairs. If it's truthful and it's unbiased, make sure it gets on public, you know, on, on, the, on the public affairs side. There's nothing wrong with getting credit for the good things you, you know, that we do, because we're certainly going to get blamed for the bad ones. So we should be our own um, not so much cheerleaders, but at least let, you know, get information, make information available when we are doing well and right. Um, and then soldier, soldier leader engagement. Um, in, in actual military operations, the best spokesperson um, for the, the United States and or, and or our partners as they're operating are our own soldiers and leaders on the ground. And so fusing them in, making sure that you have public affairs there, making sure that you're emphasizing that, with other uh, informationally related cap or capabilities abs or is absolutely essential. The final category is those that become IRCs based upon the intent. And this oftentimes starts a, a huge debate about whether where the IO sto or stops and the conventional or, or kinetic operation starts, but it's really irrelevant in the discussion. If you're using things like physical destruction to send an informational message, then that, and, and that is an IRC in and of itself. And an easy way to think of this is, are you destroying that, uh, are you destroying a target to send a message? Or are you destroying that target to, um, to physically destroy a, a, the, an adversary capability? Um, and this can, this, I use physical destruction because it's a simple um, way to think, or think it through, but other physical actions also uh, apply in, the, in, in this realm. It could be a financial action, frankly, if it's a creative thought, if you can, figure out a way to expose corruption um, by, uh, by, by looking at financial records and then publicizing them. Well, that's, a, that's an action that doesn't seem like it's an IO action, but it absolutely is. Now, you, uh, you know, you, you can get a headache thinking about all the applications of this and, and where we could go and and your, your comment about soldiers and leaders on the ground, you know, the term strategic corporal was never more true uh, than it is today. Joining us for part one, come back for part two, where the focus will be the key principles of IO and empowering leadership.